Since we can't meet in person for reunion this year, I wanted to record for you a short video that would capture at least some of the kinds of things that I like to talk about with visitors to reunion. When A.D. White and Ezra Cornell decided to found Cornell University, they realized right from the start that it was important to get materials in of various sorts for the students and faculty to work with. If you're going to found a great university up here in the middle of central New York without the resources of a major city to draw on, you've got to get the stuff in for the students and faculty to work with. And so from the start, even before the university opened, A.D. White and other original faculty members were traveling the world acquiring materials for the new university. The university library was obviously seen as a very major priority right from the start, but A.D. White also had a strong interest in material culture, in collections. Um, and so he realized that a museum would be an important part of this university as well. And McGraw Hall, the third building constructed at Cornell, was constructed to house that university museum, as well as the library originally. The museum was primarily geological and biological. Those were the two main wings. Um, and it famously included a major collection of fossils. It housed Burt Wilder's collections, for example, which included, from the beginning, skeletal and other uh, faunal specimens. Um, and then through the later 19th century into the 20th century, his collection of human brains that he very famously uh, put together. At the time that Cornell was founded, archaeology and anthropology didn't really exist as academic disciplines. Uh, anthropology didn't get started as an academic discipline until the end of the century. Archaeology was in practice, but it was primarily practiced as a museum discipline rather than a university discipline. But from the beginning, white and Cornell University's interest in the classics, in a classical education, led to some focus on archaeological materials. And there were other connections as well. Professor of Geology, Charles Fred Hart, for example, uh, did some early archaeological work in the Amazon, uh, even before coming to Cornell. He started in 1869, 1870. And his collections of Amazonian materials are among the materials that are in the anthropology collection still today. A.D. White also recognized the significance of archaeological work, um, particularly the work that was being developed in Scandinavia and in Denmark especially, looking at Neolithic sites, developing stratigraphic techniques of archaeological excavation that are still key to the field today. And in the 1870s, when some archaeological materials from Denmark became available through the commercial networks, A.D. White acquired those for Cornell. And you can see some of them over my shoulder here today. Those, those pots are Danish Neolithic, uh, and the stone tools arrayed in front of them also uh, are, are from Denmark from that period. The cornerstone of McGraw was laid in 1869, and the building was finished and opened in 1872 with the museum. It also famously housed the chimes that had been supplied by Jenny McGraw in the tower of this building, which later were moved to McGraw Tower on Uris Library and still can be heard today. There's a lot of interesting history in McGraw Hall and the University Museum. Bert Wilder, the zoologist, is a significant part of that through the 19th century until his retirement in, in 1911, actually. And in addition to the brain collection that he's most closely associated with, he prepared countless zoological specimens, uh, including primarily skeletal mounts, but he did do work, some work with skins and organs and other materials as well. He used to keep a sort of menagerie in the basement uh, of McGraw, and he had a lounge down there that was one of the few hangouts uh, in the early years of the university for students. Um, so they used to sit around in the, in the comfy chairs down there and, and, and read and, and, and relax with Wilder's cats and other animals roaming around. He had a, a bear at one point that lived here in McGraw. He kept deer in a pen out front of the building uh, in, in the early years of the of the university. Um, he was a very interesting character. He got in trouble with the trustees in the 1880s because he published both a book and a pamphlet for students on health and hygiene that included um, uh, sex and reproductive health. Uh, and that was 
in the 1880s considered fairly risque, um, and some of the trustees demanded his ouster uh, for putting that information out to students. But the students loved him as a teacher. He was, by all accounts, including A.D. White's, uh, an extremely effective teacher. And they rose to his defense uh, and demanded that he be kept on, and indeed he was. He spent the rest of his, of his life here at Cornell. Wilder used to bury carcasses of animals in the basement of the building before it was completely finished for defleshing in order to recover the, the skeletons to mount. Um, and as you can imagine, the odor from that at times could get fairly strong. Um, and eventually, the faculty who had offices in the building insisted that he stop doing that uh, and, and, and no longer bury animals in the basement. Uh, Professor Hart, who had brought in the Amazonian collections, was in charge of the more archaeological, human sorts of materials. Uh, unfortunately, he left Cornell fairly early on to take a position with the Brazilian government uh, leading their equivalent of the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, and he already had been ill, uh, I think it was yellow fever, if I remember correctly, uh, from previous work in the Amazon. And that took his life fairly shortly after he moved to Brazil, uh, and he was never able to return to Cornell. Hart's interest in archaeology did lead to another famous anthropological connection for Cornell, the anthropologist Frank Hamilton Cushing, uh, although not everyone would be willing to grant him the, the, the title of anthropologist, he was somewhat controversial. He famously went native uh, with the Zuni uh, in, in the 1880s, 1890s. Cushing's sole time in higher education was a brief period spent here at Cornell. He had heard about Hart's interest in archaeological materials, and he had been making collections himself, Cushing had, uh, since he was a, a, a teenager. In fact, he made his first donation to the Smithsonian when he was in his teens. Um, and he heard about Hart's interests, came here to visit Hart, um, and decide if Cornell was a good place for him to come and study. He and Hart did hit it off, uh, Cushing famously uh, asked if Hart had done any archaeological work here or around Cornell, and Hart sort of, of laughed it off and, and said, well, no, we've looked around, there's really nothing to be found. And, and Cushing kind of looked out the windows and surveyed the landscape and said, well, there certainly should be sites over there. Um, and Hart basically said, well, we'll prove it. So Cushing set out and trekked down to the south end of town, down around Buttermilk Falls, where he made a small collection of projectile points uh, that he brought back and strewed out on the table, uh, thereby really impressing Hart with, with, with his knowledge and ability of uh, indigenous traditions, archaeological materials, and, and so forth. And Hart invited Cushing to come and study at Cornell. Uh, unfortunately, in the six months intervening between when Cushing visited in that summer and when he came to start studying here, Hart had gone to Brazil, was no longer here. Um, and Cushing probably already knew more, certainly about local archaeological materials, than anyone uh, who would have been available to teach here. Um, and he already had connections to the Smithsonian, so he worked those connections and got, got involved in working with the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, uh, doing the ethnographic exhibits there, um, and parlayed that experience into later work in the American Southwest, where he worked with the Zuni and, 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 and went on in, in that direction. One of the reasons that Cushing is dismissed by some is his seeming unscientific kind of approach. He was a very much a Victorian romantic uh, in, in the ways that he worked. But in fact, he made some very interesting insights, uh, particularly in material culture, archaeological kinds of, of questions. He was one of the first people as a scholar to start to figure out how flint napping was done, uh, repurposing the bone handle of a toothbrush as a pressure flaker uh, to, to make stone tools. He also recognized that uh, stones with holes in them, 
or notches, uh, which are often sort of generically glossed as net sinkers, um, in, in, in good likelihood were, if not always, at least often, loom weights. Associating these artifacts with an activity that's generally associated with women rather than the fishing that's generally associated with men. Um, and that recognition of activities that are stereotypically women's um, is, is one that is still being fought for uh, in anthropology, archaeology, and the social sciences. There remains uh, some tendency when looking at an artifact from the past to fall back on stereotypical male-dominated activities like hunting, the construction of shelter, and so forth. We know better than that, but it, it still happens. After Hart left for Brazil, the archaeological, cultural, human kinds of materials in the University Museum were turned over to the charge of a historian, Moses Coit Tyler. And he, although a good historian, didn't really have much interest in material culture. And so not much happened with the collections from the late 1870s, early 1880s, and up until the time of the Second World War. Just before, and then picking up again after the Second World War, what was to become the anthropology department got started at Cornell. And at that time, even though archaeology was not a major focus of the program, there was recognition that archaeological materials would be useful for teaching purposes, and so the collections that had been left to lie for, for decades began to be reorganized, uh, recatalogued, gotten back in shape for use in teaching. Professor Lauriston Sharp, whom some alumni will remember still, was one of the key figures in this. And he himself had interests in material culture, collecting Hmong clothing in Southeast Asia uh, and having collected uh, some Australian Aboriginal materials as well, um, beginning in his original fieldwork with the Uriurant in the 1930s. But those are stories for another time. Um, for now, let me just say I'm, I'm missing seeing all of you this year. Uh, I hope that I'll get to see you again in future years at Reunion, and do, please, feel free to, to, to be in touch. We love to hear from alumni, and I love having opportunities to show off the anthropology collections and tell you stories about them.